Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Last week we made uh, this little guy, which was a simple way to attach a DSLR camera to whatever you like. And this was a great beginner lathe project. You may want to watch that video first because it's got some useful context for this week's project, which is a much more sophisticated version that has a free rotating element and a quick release function and uh, locks onto your camera and once again, anything you like, including a Nova arm. So let's dive into this project right now. Here's what we're going to build today. So the body of the mount is shown in blue there and it screws into the bottom of the camera. And then the knob shown in yellow tightens everything down. And so you can see there's two slits there in the body. So the uh, lower portion of the body forms a band clamp effectively. And then inside there, there's a, a shaft in orange that threads into the Noga arm or whatever else you want to attach your camera to. And you might be wondering what that extra little slit there is for, but I'll be explaining that in a moment. However, we're going to start by making the body of the clamp, the blue part. Uh, we're going to start with that because it's the most complicated part and also because uh, the other parts can be fitted to it if necessary. So I'm going to make this guy out of brass and uh, so I've got some 360 free machining brass here chucked up in the three jaw and uh, I cut what I thought was going to be just the right amount and yeah well hmm, I measured wrong and had to cut another piece. This is just the first of many many mistakes that I'm going to make on this part so uh, yeah buckle up. Anyway I honed up my tool nice and sharp and polished up the radius a little bit and then started off by facing the end of our bar as is tradition. Now we can get started turning this guy down to diameter and we've got a long way to go. The stock is quite a bit oversized, but it's what I had on hand. Brass is a fantastic material for small machines and also for beginners because it's uh, got great chip action. It's pretty easy to get uh, good surface finishes on it and it's so easy to cut. You know, as you can see here, this is 120 thou pass, which there's very few materials that you could do a cut like that on a small hobby machine like this, but brass will make you feel like you have big girl machine tools. Okay, we're ready for some layout here and I'm going to try a new product I haven't used before. One of my viewers let me know that Dicam comes in these dauber bottles, so it's like a giant felt pen that spits out Dicam. And uh, it works uh, really, really well on flat surfaces. On the lathe it's a little bit streaky, but it is very tidy, so I, uh, I like it quite a bit. And uh, it's also great for those rousing after hours games of machinist bingo. Okay, I got my diameter changes marked here, and uh, I'm going to set my depth using an indicator here on the carriage because I've just faced the end so I know where the end of that tool is and then I'll re-zero that guy and then we're going to turn down this area here. Uh, this is going to form the, the main body of the mounting system for all the other parts. And we're going for a one inch diameter here. So we'll do a finishing pass. I'm just using the same sharp nose tool for every operation here. It's working fine because brass is very forgiving. And that should be our final pass, and yikes, wow. It didn't have to be that precise, but I'll take it. And then we'll just check the depth of our shoulder here, and the depth of our shoulder is actually a, lit, a little too deep, so the nice thing about this being our first operation is that we can just face off the excess here. So we were about 8 thou deep, so I just face 8 thou off the front, and now our shoulder is perfect. Now be careful with that trick if you've got other dimensions laid out as I do because those other lines are now all 8 thou off. So now I'm going to spot and drill this hole. It needs to be exactly 750 thou deep. So I've got a 16 thou shim in there that I've just lightly pinned against the surface. And I set the tailstock hand wheel to negative 16. And so now when I wind in I know that the tip of the drill is going to be exactly on the surface at zero. And then I can count to exactly 750 thou depth on the hand wheel and I know that my hole depth is going to be right on. Now, of course, that's you know going to the end of the drill, not including the 118 degree angle on it, but that's okay. We're gonna square up the bottom of that hole in a separate operation here in a moment. But before I do that, I've got a grooving tool in here and I'm gonna square up the tool post and then uh, I'm gonna recess the area behind my part. So here's a trick I learned from Joe Pye. I'm using a razor blade and just sweeping the surface and you can use that to feel when the end of the tool is exactly on the surface. And then I can use an indicator to count back the exact right amount so that I'm grooving directly behind the top surface of my part. And you'll notice that I'm behind my layout line. There's that eighth thou error that we talked about. And uh, I'm gonna do a series of grooves here behind uh, this uh, top of the part. 
And uh, the reason that I'm doing this is that we're going to need an arbor to hold on to this part. And uh, that larger diameter is too big for uh, a 5C collet. So I'm reducing the diameter back here to one inch so that I can put it in a 5C collet for a future operation that we're going to need to do on the mill. So uh, this area here looks to be about enough. So uh, I do uh, several passes on the grooving tool going into the same depth. And then at the very end, you can just wind the tool across and uh, even up all of the surfaces. If the front of your grooving tool isn't exactly perfect, then uh, you'll get, be left with a little bit of a wavy surface. So you can just sweep across and smooth it all out. And we'll see how we did. And once again, that was accidentally perfect. That's much more precise than we need to hold it with a collet, but I will take it. The reason we need that arbor is to hold on to the part in the mill, as I said, because we're going to be using the slitting saw to make those slots. So here's the arbor that we just made shown in teal, and I went ahead and modeled the slitting saw in Fusion because this operation is really tricky. I need to know how much of an arbor I need in order for the slitting saw to clear the vise when it's held in the collet. And this also lets me verify that the slitting saw is not going to hit the threads there that go into the camera. And uh, this also explains why there's an extra slot uh, in the top of the part that isn't strictly necessary. It's just for, let's say, machinability. And this exercise also made me realize that I don't have enough arbor. Uh, I need more here. So I went back in and turned down the uh, remainder of the area that I, that I have behind the part. Luckily, I had just enough to pull this off. So I was able to turn it down and, and then blend in the surfaces so that uh, I had a nice even one inch diameter all the way across there. And uh, unfortunately, this did mean I had to turn right up to the chuck, and I didn't want to move it in the chuck while I was turning because I'd lose my concentricity. But before we part it off, we need to finish this hole. Wherein I forget everything I know about machining. Remember, we left a drill cone in the bottom of that, so we need to square it up. So my really terrible idea was that I thought I would go in with an end mill and square up the bottom of that hole. So I thought, oh, I know, I'll just buy one of those Morse Taper 2 end mill holders and then put it in my tailstock and square up the bottom of the hole. So uh, again, I used that uh, trick for finding the surface, and then I proceeded to wind in with this end mill. Now, end mills are not reamers. And when you make an end mill cut on more than one side at a time, it cuts over size. These are all things I know. And for some reason, I just forgot that I know all those things. And I proceeded to try this stupid idea anyway. And uh, I got chatter in there like crazy. And the hole came in too shallow. And this was the point I realized I had used a non-center cutting end mill. One more mistake for the pile. So I went back and looked a little harder. And I did manage to find a 3 8 two flute end mill that would properly center cut the bottom of that hole. But then I went in and checked with my 3 8 reamer. And yeah, it was quite a bit oversized. So at this point, I had to make a decision. Do I stop and remake this part right now, uh, knowing the terrible mistake that I've made here? Or do I try and recover? So what I decided to do is try and recover because I should be able to just make the pin that's going to go in that hole oversize and uh, everything should work out. So what should I have done? Well, the most precise way to make a flat bottomed hole like this is with a boring bar. Now, this particular hole would need a very, very small boring bar, and I don't have one that small. So that was partly why I didn't try that. Another good option would have been to just drill it a little deeper than necessary and then just go in with a reamer. Reamers can, to some degree, clean up the bottom of a drill cone. If you don't have to make them do too much work, they can cut on their ends a little bit as long as you have the hole a little deeper than necessary. So I decided to press on with chamfering the edges and parting it off. Now I needed uh, more room to part here, so I pulled the part out of the chuck a little bit. And of course that introduced crazy run out because I moved it in the three jaw chuck, but that's okay, we're just parting off. So this seemed to be going fine. And then I heard a terrible noise and I stopped and well, that's fun. I was doing a little extra parting with the tool holder over there on the right. So uh, yeah, there's uh, just nothing it seems like that won't go wrong with this part, but uh, I reset my parting blade and yeah, let's see. So let's take a closer look at my failure there. You can see the uh, chatter marks actually came out kind of like rifling, which is sort of amusing. But uh, the bottom of the hole looks good, so we're going to press on. And uh, so I'm going to set it up in my 5C collet block here on the mill. And uh, we're going to start by drilling the cross hole. But before we do that, I want to make sure that this setup is going to have room for the slitting saw so that I don't have to move it. So uh, we can see how that saw is going to make it all the way into the top of the part. So that's good. 
So then I proceeded to set up a machinist jack here for a little support underneath and a clamp for the top to secure that in place. Then I realized I'd forgotten to do my edge finding, which I need to locate the hole to drill. So uh, the clamps and stuff were all in the way, so I had to take it all down. I did my edge finding, and located my hole, forgot to put the jack and the clamp back in, and proceeded to cut the relief needed for the top of the clamping hole. Uh, luckily I got away with this despite having no support. I did manage to drill it with the wrong size end mill the first time. Luckily it was too small so I was able to just go in again with the larger one. Again there seems to be no mistake that I won't make on this part. And then I realized what I'd done and uh, put the jack back in at least to drill the hole. There wasn't room for the clamp at the top but I could at least get some support underneath it. Then I spotted and drilled with a number seven. This is the tapping drill size for quarter 20 which is the thread that forms the uh, clamping action for the band clamp and then the top half of that hole gets enlarged to the clearance size for quarter 20 so that when the clamping bolt threads in there it's squeezing the threaded portion in the bottom half up against the free running top half and gives you that clamping action. And here you can see the shoulder that we made with the counter bore and that shoulder is what uh, gives us the clamping action. The knob is going to tighten down against that shoulder and pull the bottom half of the clamp upwards. And then we can come in with our quarter 20 tap and tap it straight through. The top half of the hole will remain untouched because it's clearance drilled. And we're using the spring loaded tap follower that you saw me make a couple of weeks ago. All right, now we can put our clamp back in because we are ready to set up for the slitting saw. So I'm using a two and a half inch diameter, 364 slitting saw. And uh, we need to set this guy up on the vertical center line of the part. So I'm just touching off on the top of the part. And uh, then we come over and then we come down half the diameter of the part plus half the thickness of the saw and we proceed to make our cuts. On the first pass, I move in as close as I dare to the vise and I set a zero on the DRO so that I can come back to that position each time and I can make all of my passes with confidence. This is 250 RPM and I'm doing 60 thou passes, which is pretty conservative, but you can see that this really cheap slitting saw arbor that I'm using has a lot of run out in it. So the saw is cutting pretty intermittently, so I'm taking it kind of easy because of that. I really uh, should put it on the project list to make a better slitting saw arbor. They're not difficult to make. Next we need to make that other slot that's orthogonal to this one. So I've got it set up vertically now in the vise and I'm just indicating that in and getting it tappy tap tapped nice and vertical. I want the slit to be flush with the underside of that surface there. So I touch off the saw on that surface and then proceed to do 60 thou passes once again. And I'm milling on the Y axis here so that the cutting forces are all front to back on the vise jaws. If I was cutting on the X axis, it would be more convenient because I've got a power feed, but on the X axis, then I'm relying on the friction of the jaws to keep that collet block from slipping out of vertical, which would not work very well. And interestingly, despite touching off on the surface, you can see that I actually kind of missed a little bit. The saw came in a little high. Not exactly sure what happened here, but eh, add it to the mistake pile for this part. Now I switch out to the four jaw chuck because we're going to need to do a couple more operations in the lathe on this part and I want to keep my concentricity. So I dial this guy back in. And I want to do the knurling on this section next. So I'll remove the die cam from that and set up the knurling tool and away we go. Okay, that's looking good. Now I'll come back in with my chamfer tool and just to take the messy edges off of that knurl. Now I'm going to flip this guy around and I'm being careful to put the split line of the band clamp under one of the jaws because otherwise uh, it might squeeze the clamp closed and I would lose my concentricity. Every so often through no skill of my own I somehow accidentally get a part dialed in like incredibly perfectly. Like I was almost thinking the indicator wasn't working so I checked it and yeah no that's just perfect. Yeah. It was an accident, but I'll take it. Anyway, the point of flipping it around was so that we could part off the arbor that we no longer need. And you can see some run out in the part there that got introduced by the uh, parting operation. I think it's because I wasn't squeezing super tight on the jaws because I was worried about compressing that clamp. So I had to dial it back in again. And now we can come in and turn down this area that's gonna become the quarter 20 screw that goes into the camera. And on the final pass, I turn in and lock the carriage and wind out. And you can see all the striations on the face there as I did each pass up to the same mark on the indicator. So a facing pass removes them all. And I'll go ahead and put a nice little chamfer on the end of that just to help the thread die get started. And then I'll come back in with my tailstock die holder and cut the quarter 20 thread on there. This is a shop made tailstock die holder. 
and uh, people often ask me to do a video about it, so I keep threatening to do so. I intentionally made this shaft a little long so that I could come back in and face it down to the exact 180 thou length that the ISO 1222-2010 standard for consumer tripod mounts specifies that it should be. A little test fit on the camera and it threads in nicely, but as expected it doesn't seat all the way down because we still have a little bit of a shoulder at the base of that thread. So I come back in here and undercut it with my thinnest parting blade. I was trying to avoid doing this, uh, but uh, you know this ended up costing me about half a thread. I've still got two and a half threads on there, so I think it's okay, and it does seat very nicely on the camera now. Uh, another alternative that I showed in the previous video would be to, instead of undercutting it, put something like a rubber pad or a star washer or a nylon washer, something at the base of that thread to take up the shoulder. And I'm not going to chamfer the end of this because I want to keep all the threads that we've got there. I really don't think we can afford to lose any at this point. And here's the final part. I'm actually really pleased with how it turned out. Despite all the mistakes, it's going to be perfectly serviceable. And you know, I always show my mistakes on this channel, which I think people appreciate, but also I do it to show you that you can make mistakes in machining and still end up with usable parts, especially here in the hobby shop. So don't be afraid to try things or don't be afraid to make mistakes. And uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to start over for every tiny little mistake that you might make. But after all that, it's time to clean out the chip tray. Next we're going to make the clamping knob shown here in yellow and you can see that it has a shoulder that tightens and uh, it interfaces with the shaft in the center to lock everything together. I'm going to make this knob out of aluminum. The uh, brass part turned out kind of heavier than I expected so uh, I'm getting a little bit worried about weight for the whole assembly. We can chuck that guy up in the lathe. The end is already faced so we don't need to do that but I am going to punch a center in it for some tail support. Now for cutting fluid, I'm going to try something new. I've had a couple of people tell me isopropyl alcohol is like the secret sauce for aluminum, so I thought I'd give it a shot. And uh, wow, look at that surface finish. I gotta say that's pretty darn impressive. I was hoping it would uh, help with breaking chips as well, but it doesn't. I got my usual rat's nest, but the uh, finish is really quite amazing. Other than some fine scratches caused by the rat's nests rubbing on the uh, part, the, uh, the finish is pretty close to a mirror straight off the tool, so pretty interesting. One downside to the alcohol though is it is actually a mild solvent for die cam, so it uh, is actually taking some of the die cam off the part. But uh, all in all, uh, I'm pretty impressed with it. I'm still getting rat's nest chips, so I cranked up the feed as high as it would go. I think this is a 15 thou per revolution, and now I'm getting some okay chip action for aluminum anyway. And uh, the nice thing about such an aggressive feed is it turning down the diameter is very fast. So in just a couple of passes, we are at dimension, and I can blue this up and mark the area where the shoulder is going to be. Now this shoulder has to be square because it's for clamping, and uh, I'm going to use a grooving tool to turn down this whole area because I can't remove the tail stock, and it would be in the way if I was trying to use like a shoulder turning technique. So this grooving tool makes quick work of that, and this is the same technique I showed when I made the arbor behind the brass part. And a quick test fit on the clearance section of the band clamp, and that slides on there very nice. So we can proceed to turning down the end here a little bit further for the quarter 20 thread that's going to go on there. You can see that I moved the tailstock for this, so of course the part deflected somewhat. So I did a spring pass on the way back to make sure that I hit my dimension with the depth of cut that I was expecting to get. And a quick check with the micrometer reveals that we did indeed hit our dimension, so that's good. Now we're ready to cut our threads on the end of that part. And this is a simple quarter 20 thread, and this is aluminum, so the thread cuts very, very easily. Now with all this stick out and being aluminum, I really don't have the rigidity for the chamfer tool, so I just hit it with a file to clean up that end. And we'll do a little test fit on the clamp here. It threads on nicely, but it doesn't seat all the way down. It looks like my counterbore ended up a little undersized. I'm not sure how that happened, but it's an easy fix. I just turned down the shoulder on our clamping bolt here a little bit. And now that threads on past the counter bore, but it still won't go all the way down. So you can see here that it looks like I need about another half thread in there to clear the threaded area of the clamp. So I did that. Now it seats down nicely on that shoulder, which is good because that's where the clamping action comes from. And then if we look on the inside, we can see that uh, we have the threaded area where it needs to be, and we still have the smooth shoulder in the area that interfaces with the shaft in the center, which is what we want. But now we need to see if we actually get clamping action out of this. So I took the slitting saw that made the slit and I put it back in there and then just tightened it down to see if it would grab onto that saw. And uh, so I snug that guy up and that saw is in there nice and tight, so that's good. And then if I loosen this guy, it should fall out. So that's great, we're actually getting clamping out of our band clamp. The finishing touches are all that's left, so we'll go ahead and knurl the human interface here. And this is a uh, larger interaction surface than we made before, so I'm 
uh, cranking back and forth on the carriage with the neural wheel and tightening it a little bit on each pass. And this is aluminum, so the neural wheels make quick work of it. That is delightful. Now we just gotta chamfer this side of the neural here while we have easy access to it. And then we're ready to part this guy off. Now I went in part way, eh, get it? And uh, then I came back in with the chamfer tool to chamfer that edge while we have access to it, and then come back in and finish the parting. And Yahtzee. And the point of that was on the off chance I got a good finish with the parting blade, I wouldn't have to flip it around to do the chamfer. But I didn't, so I had to flip it around and face it off anyway. And while I was here, I got inspired to put a little dish detail in the top just for uh, extra style points. And between you and me, there's some run out in that dish feature because the part had been flipped in the three jaw and we lost concentricity. But nevertheless, I'm quite chuffed with how that part turned out. However, that alcohol sprayed diluted dicam everywhere, and my alter ego took one for the team there, so it wouldn't clean off. But uh, luckily, I have boxes of these things, so like it never happened. The last part to make is the pin that goes in the center. And the most interesting part of this is that curved groove that runs around the center there. And that's going to be a fun little detail to make, so we'll get to that. But we'll start by getting some mild steel here in the chuck and facing that, punching a center, yada yada, tail support, you know the drill. And we'll turn this down to diameter. And I'm choosing to make this guy out of steel for maximum strength because this is kind of the critical part of the whole assembly. In the last video, I talked about this classic problem of turning close to a 60 degree center with an 85 degree turning tool and how you could hypothetically turn a 55 degree turning tool and use that to get in real close to the live center and thus turn small diameters. And then hypothetically, you could have a YouTube channel where you make bad jokes about things being hypothetical when you're clearly doing them. Now, as I was turning this down, I forgot that I was supposed to be making it oversized to compensate for the error I had made on the bore in the brass part. But uh, as I was setting up for my finishing pass, I remembered at the last second and uh, checked the fit. And actually, we were pretty much right there. It was maybe a hair loose, but it was going to work, I think. So I decided to just press on with this. And uh, yeah, that's not going to work. On now to the most interesting feature of this part, that curved groove in the middle that uh, rides on the shoulder on the tightening bolt. So I'm going to do this with a form tool. So uh, here's uh, an eighth inch radius gauge, and that's what we're going to need here. So uh, I've got a tool bit here that I've blued up, and then I'm going to mark it with this radius gauge just as kind of a rough guideline. It's, uh, it's not going to be perfect, and I, I kind of missed the edge there, but that's okay. It's just a guideline. And then I go over to the grinder and spend a lot of quality time getting covered in grit to make our special form tool. I've got my table set at a 10 degree angle, so as I'm grinding here, I'm automatically ending up with the right clearance underneath. And uh, I was just working to the radius gauge little by little, and you, here's the final result. So I'm very pleased with that fit. And uh, now I'll go ahead and hone it. And uh, the thing about honing, of course, is that it's never going to clean up the entire surface that you just ground. It's only going to clean up the top and bottom because the grounding wheel is round and the stone is flat. But that's okay, as long as the critical surfaces are nice and sharp. This groove needs to be exactly 63 thousandths deep, so I'm touching off with the form tool, and then I set an indicator on the tool post at zero, but then I take the form tool out, and I go back in with a parting blade, and I remove most of the material with that. Form tools are very high tool pressure, and they really want to chatter, especially in steel. So the parting blade does most of the work, and then setting that indicator zero allows me to get the form tool back in and have it be exactly on the surface, or where the surface was, because the parting blade removed it. And so now I can go in 63 thou from here, and know that I'm going to end up at the correct depth with the form tool. That feature turned out really nice. I didn't get any chatter in there, and that looks like it's going to fit on that knob perfectly, so that's good. So we can go back in and cut the M61 thread on the bottom of that, which goes into the Noga arm or whatever else you'd like to attach the camera to. And Yahtzee. And then I flip this guy around, face off the end, and put a generous chamfer on it to make it easier to slide the body mount onto it. Okay, we finally have all our parts. We've got the brass body, the aluminum knob, and here's that steel pin that we just made. So let's do some final assembly and see how it all goes together. So the pin goes in the body, and then the knob threads in there and gives us our clamping action, and then the shoulder on that knob interfaces with the groove in that pin and holds the entire assembly together while still allowing it to rotate around that pin if the clamp is loosened. All right, so it's looking good. We'll go ahead and install the pin in the Noga arm here with the jam nut and put the body on the camera and see how it goes together. So far, so good. Okay, and that guy slides right over the pin. 
and then we thread our clamping knob on there and we just tighten that knob and then the camera will remain motionless. Uh-oh. So with the final assembly, we're not getting the clamping action that we expected, even though we did that test with the slitting saw. So let's see if we can figure out what's going wrong here. First, I tried clamping it with a different piece of quarter 20 hardware with a nylon washer there to protect the brass, and I still couldn't get it to clamp. So it's not the clamping bolt that's the problem. So I tried maybe uh, deepening the slit there a little bit with a hacksaw because the material at the back here might be a little too thick. It might be uh, too difficult to get enough clamping motion and uh, that still didn't help. Now we know from the slitting saw test that we are getting clamping action, just not very much possibly. So remember the pin was a little bit looser than I wanted, so I put a 1,000 shim on there and uh, tried tightening the knob down on that. And uh, yeah, now it's rock solid. So the problem is just that the pin is a little bit too small. So I made it again, this time a couple thousandths larger. And uh, so we'll do a test fit on this guy. Thread that knob in there. And that is perfect, that is rock solid. I can loosen it a half turn, reposition it, tighten it a half turn, stays exactly where it was put. That is exactly how I want it to work. And that combines nicely with the action of the Noga arm to allow me to very quickly position this camera anywhere in space. And then that uh, clamping mechanism also acts as a quick release so I can quickly unthread that knob, pull the whole camera off, and put it back on very fast. And you could uh, make more of those pins and put them on any other devices that you wanted to attach that same camera to. So that's the whole mechanism working as intended. I'm very happy with how this project turned out. I hope you enjoyed watching me make it. Drawings and models are on my Patreon, and I'll see you next time.